emails and so forth, like who's, who's responding. Um, all right. I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to give it to Laurel. Laurel, hit record. I just hit record. So everyone should get a little note that that's okay. happening. I see it up at the top. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming in. <clears throat> I'm going to apologize beforehand. I'm getting over a cold. And so I might be still sniffly and coffee a little bit. Um, my name is Laurel Downs and Lee Greenwood is my supervisor and together we make up the Don't Move Firewood team. And so this is October and October is Firewood Month and we thought we would celebrate with a couple webinars just going over real broadly our services, what we do, all of our resources and sort of, you know, basically show the avenues about how you can get involved with the campaign and really increase awareness on the topic of forest pests and the firewood pathway. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to try to keep it as short and succinct as possible and offer, you know, lots of time for discussion and questions. And of course, if you have any questions during, this is pretty casual. It's a regular call format. So if you want to just take yourself off mute and just shout out, that's no problem at all. All right get moving here um so lee i think you are going to take it away with this next slide and then i'll jump in a little bit later that sounds great so um as everybody on this phone call uh hopefully can appreciate uh firewood as a whole is a broad pathway for invasive insects forest insects and diseases um to be spread once they have established uh in any given place um, so we know the very basics here that forest pests can and do move on the pathway of firewood. One of the realities of firewood is that the regulations governing um, what firewood should or should not or can or cannot be moved are not comprehensive, um, either within the U.S. or Canada, nor are they consistent either between countries or between states in the U.S. or between provinces in the U.S. or even occasionally um, certain sections of some states in the United States as well. And then new pest outbreaks come to light basically uh, every year in some way, whether that's a new incidence of an existing pest or a new pest entirely. So it's a complicated set of forest pest concerns. Uh, oh, Laurel, next slide. I'm just trying to scroll. <laughs> uh, okay, so the guiding principles that we use in order to best tackle all of this complexity is to really focus on what's our goal. Our goal is to protect trees, uh, and we have many ways across forest health to protect trees from many things. So you have to narrow down your um, the, the whole universe of ways that you can protect trees. And the one tactic that we are using, because this is our specialty, is to slow the spread of invasive forest pests that occur and spread in the firewood pathway. So it's a very specific role within the larger goal of protecting trees. And in order to do that, we have a very specific target audience, which is firewood users and their group educators. So approximate, we know from polling that approximately 50% of uh, people in the United States say they use firewood in a given year. Um, so we know that we don't have to reach everybody in the US. We can actually just reach half of them if we know how to find them. And what, what are we trying to reach them with is specific messages both in the undesirable behavior and then the desirable behavior to encourage them to take action in the good best practices direction. So the undesirable thing is moving firewood. So, so we say, don't move firewood. And then we tell them, well, what could you do if you're going to use firewood, which is the three basic messages that we push forward, depending on circumstance, to buy it where you burn it, to gather or collect firewood on site, or to buy certified heat treated firewood when it's available on the market. Okay, next slide. Uh, Laurel, I think this is usually your slide. This is me. Um, <clears throat> so our website is don'tmovefirewood.org and there we have a litany of really great content and easy to use, easy to pull off, um, both for fi everyday firewood users, as well as stakeholder groups, uh, fellow educators, really anyone in the forest health community. Um, and first and foremost, we have our resource library. So if you're looking for specific wording or graphics or inspiration, anything like that, 
Um, this is a great place to go and you can just pull stuff right out of there. Or you can contact myself or Lee and just be like, listen, I love this graphic that you did for Nevada. Can you do something similar for us? And we would be happy to work with you and customize those graphics. Uh, and that is actually a free service we provide. Um, any associated cost would just be if you want something physically printed, then you would print it yourself. But as far as design and everything else goes, that's something that we can provide for you. Um, also, we have our firewood map. And so this is a great place to go. You can click on any state or providence and see exactly the situation in that area, whether it be specific regulations or quarantines in effect, um, you know, different forest pests of concern or threats. Um, outreach or websites that are relevant from different agencies in that state or anything like that, that's the place to go. And this is really fine-tuned for the public. Um, so we take a lot of technical and esoteric information and we break it down into a layman's term to make it the most useful and least confusing it can possibly be. Um, so if people can just go there, hey, I know I'm camping in Oregon, what's the situation there? They can pull it up and find out pretty quickly what they have um, going on in that place. So, excuse me, we also have um, information on the forest pests and pathogens themselves. That's a great place to learn about them. Um, we have the news blog. So anytime we do webinars like this or any sort of publications that come out that are relevant that we think is um, particularly useful, uh, stuff like that, we'll post up on the news or blog tab at the top. Um, <clears throat> 10 of our most popular websites or web pages are translated into Spanish. So that's obviously very helpful in those states and areas that have a lot of Spanish speakers. Um, and then we just have a lot of other resources, like I said, for fellow educators. So we have toolkits surrounding different outreach events, which I'll get into a little bit more, um, as well as things like our giant firewood comparison report, which I'll talk about as well. And so those are really kind of a little bit more technical and or focused on um, outreach strategies themselves and what we found to be most effective. And so... Uh, again, just really almost anything you're looking for about the firewood pathway, you'll be able to find on our website. And I don't know why that's taking me a minute. There we go. Um, as far as specific outreach initiatives, so it is October. October is firewood month. This is our baby. Um, this is when we really kind of push our message into several different audiences. It's just the perfect time of year for it, really. Um, it's a time of year where a lot of places in the United States are gorgeous with the foliage and there's a lot of hunting seasons this time of year. So we're targeting different audiences who um, really get out at this in this month. <clears throat> but we also, excuse me, we also um, participate in a lot of other outreach events as well. So, for instance, National Invasive Species Awareness Week, Invasive Plant Pest Disease Awareness Week, Emerald Ash Borer. We did some webinars this last EAB week. Uh, Plant Clean Go, National Moth Week. Really, there's a lot of different events throughout the year. A lot of them are spearheaded by some of our partners. And we just try to get involved as possible and, you know, amplify the message that human behavior can be um, altered in a way that's responsible and, you know, really reduces the threat to forest health. And so anything that, you know, we think our message lines up with, we're happy to play a part in. As far as Firewood Month specifically, um, we have an entire toolkit on this on our website. Lee, I don't know if you want to post that. That would be great. Um, so that folks, anyone who's doing this sort of thing this month could find uh, you can really pick and choose what's most useful to you and your area and, you know, your audience. But we tend to break it down into four different weeks. Um, the first one being that broad audience. So we talk generally about forest pests and the firewood pathway and some best practice information. Those those three big messages that Lee mentioned in the beginning, local firewood, uh, gather responsibly on site where permitted and certified heat treated firewood. Obviously, you know, which of those three you kind of focus on, again, depends on specifically your area and the situation. Uh, if, you know, collecting was even even allowed, depends on the land and the authoritative body behind it. But 
Um, and then for week two, we do focus on those recreationalists. So hunters, uh, we have an entire page on our website focused on hunters and how they can help and help conserve those resources. Um, you know, this is a good time of year for leaf peeping, um, also birding. So anyone who's just getting out there, RVers, it's just a really popular time of year for that. So we're really focusing on those people who get out and do those activities. Uh, week three, you know, again, you can keep it general or you can focus on the forest um, products industry, forest industries, and kind of make that connection about how protecting nature isn't just important in and of itself, but it also is important because we use a lot of these natural resources and forest health <clears throat> plays hand in hand um, with that. So everyone's got a role to play. Uh, and then we kind of wrap it up with focusing on an audience that uses firewood for heating, whether that be their home or their cabin. Um, and then obviously this is the same time of year as Halloween. So we tend to have a post or two to make it fun for that. And we actually have uh, pest masks. Uh, it's one of the things you can find on our resource library. And that can be a really fun, great activity for kids. So as I mentioned, you know, we, we split it up like this, but people can pick and choose whatever's useful for them. And in that toolkit, you know, it just really breaks down and makes, it makes your life easy because you can just pull stuff right out of there, wording everything uh, and just get involved like that. Um, continuing on with some resources that are particularly useful for other people in the forest health community uh, and other educators, as well as regulators and <clears throat> anyone on the professional side of things, really. Um, we did a huge firewood comparison report a couple years ago, and since then we've updated it. I think I think it's on the fourth publication now. It's a ever evolving document. Um, but we looked at the entire regulatory and outreach environment that relates to the firewood pathway, and it was a huge undertaking. And it's a lot of moving parts, as I said, and it's something, again, we're always trying to update and keep fresh and accurate. Um, but this is really a one-stop shop for any and all information that you could think of pretty much as, as much as it relates to firewood movement. Um, and that can be really helpful, you know, if if what you're looking for isn't specified or laid out on the firewood map and you're like, no, I want to find that, you know, specific legal document. A lot of times that's linked right in that report. So really helpful. Um, and without going into too much detail on this, I will just say like the the big takeaway is that there's a lot of inconsistency as far as regulations go, especially. Um, we even looked into the, you know, things that affects the commercial firewood market and movement. Um, such things like certification, kiln certification. With the federal deregulation of emerald ash borer, um, some states lost their ability to certify that firewood, which, which affected that firewood market. And so we looked at, you know, what states are able to certify their own kilns and how that matches up with neighboring states and, you know, how that entire market really was affected. Some big picture stuff there. And so anyone who's interested can take a look at that. Um, <clears throat> and as I mentioned, we update this regularly. So if you notice something on there that's out of date, you know, or something happened in your state or area that is new, please reach out. I'm always, you know, keeping a running list of things to change for our next publication. Um, as an outreach agency, what we focus the most on is outreach. And this is where we can provide, you know, the most help. And so we really took a fine tooth comb to the outreach side of things on the state level. And we looked across four different metrics specifically. So we looked at state agencies like firewood communication, any relevant agency, uh, cooperative extension. Uh, and then we really focused on camping related pages for state parks, as well as the reservation process. Um, we think that, you know, especially those latter two are probably the most important as you're everyday firewood user are going to be accessing those sites. Um, and things that we love to see would be, you know, firewood alerts and messages that are in highly relevant locations and just stand out. So we think of them as highly visible. Stuff that has good action-oriented wording, um, telling folks not just not to move firewood, but what they should do instead. Excellent. We love seeing that. And so anytime we see this sort of messaging, you know, that gets a green check mark in our book. Um, 
And so that's the sort of thing we looked for uh, across these four metrics for every single state. And for the most part, state agencies did pretty well. This is typically the Department of Agriculture, um, as they tend to be the legislative body behind a lot of regulations that affect firewood movement. And so that makes sense. Um, and that's great. And that's important to have that there. The problem, if you think about it practically, is that, again, your everyday firewood users are not likely to be visiting the State Department of Agriculture website. Um, they're going to be accessing, you know, more <clears throat> relevant locations like state parks, uh, even cooperative extension. You know, that they're great educators as well. And so not doing quite as well or consistent on those three metrics. Cooperative extension has a lot of low visibility information. What do I mean by that? Um, the information is there, but a lot of times it takes some digging on my part to find it. And so again, not likely to be jumping out at people who aren't looking for this information. And that's because just by their nature, cooperative extension tends to do a lot of articles, which can be highly visible for a, a short period of time. And then they tend to get buried over time. Um, you know, state parks, on the other hand, any sort of firewood information on camping related pages, super important. That's what we're looking for. Even frequently asked questions and stuff, because if you think about it, a firewood user isn't necessarily looking for this information. Again, they're looking for, can I bring my dog? What's the cost of, you know, reserving here? Are there trails? That sort of thing. So any sort of camping related pages, you want to have that information. You're most likely to like, again, raise that awareness where it might not have been before. Um, especially important for the reservation process, because again, you know that these people are reserving a campsite, very likely to use firewood. You want to reach them before they bring firewood from a long distance to that area. Um, so if you want to look at the firewood comparison report, I leave, would you mind putting that link in there too? I have it pulled up, but I can't see it with my screen. I don't want to mess it up. Um, and you see in your state, like, oh, hey, maybe we're doing okay. We want to improve something here. Uh, again, please reach out because this is something that we can make your lives so much easier. You can just tell me, you know, hey, can I get some example wording, you know, for X, Y, and Z, or it could be related to a pest, anything, and I'll be happy to send you over stuff. Um, that's my job. So I am happy to do that. Actually, something we've done recently, a few states have had some interest in and we're doing more. I think we're doing Washington next week is we've had some folks reach out and we give them their own customized presentation. So it's very similar to this in that we um, talk to some agency folks and we tell them how we can help. And then we systematically go through their websites with screenshots about what they have, what they don't have, and what they could have and where. And so I think that makes people's lives a lot easier. It gives them really easily actionable items to do, even if, you know, they're not the one doing it. They can just take that, pull it right off our presentation on the PDF form, whatever, send it to their IT folks and be like, here, here's everything. All you have to do is copy and paste. And so we've seen several states uh, really improve their outreach since the beginning of our firewood comparison report and since we've started doing these kind of customized presentations and that's something we're happy to keep doing it's it's a lot of work that is just taken right off of you we can do it all and just <clears throat> basically you paste it right in so um i think that is it for me let me just make sure oh no last thing i'm gonna say is partner collaboration highlights um, we could not do this work alone. We work with a lot of people. We're funded by USDA APHIS. They have their own campaigns, Hungry Pass. We work a lot with Play Clean Go. Um, a lot of partners, you know, tribal, regional, state, everything. It takes, you know, an army to get this message across and stay consistent. And so even places that don't have regulations, you know, keeping that best practice wording and messaging out there is so important. And we have a lot of help doing that. And so, we just want to, you know, highlight that, highlight some of our partners. Um, Firewood Scout is another one we do. We help them out with, you know, keeping that message consistent and promoting them. They provide, um, you know, local vendors for people looking them in several different states. Uh, and then one we've done more recently is uh, we've worked with the Firewood Banks program. We just gave a great presentation at their virtual summit. Um, to, again, just kind of keep that message involved in the conversation uh, with some of the great work they're doing. So thanks to all of those folks.
and lean back at you now. Sounds good. Okay, just a friendly reminder, I put some links upon Laurel's request into the chat. So please go ahead and like open those windows uh, so that you can look at those later. Um, and yeah, okay. So uh, depending on our budget year to year, we do a wide variety of different um, paid and in-kind donated advertising placements in order to get our message across to the largest possible audiences. So we have a Google AdWords grant, which is an in-kind donation from Google that we can access as a nonprofit. Um, some years were uh, exceeding, I think, $50,000, $60,000 worth of donated advertisement space. So this is a substantial grant. We also do banner ads, which are like the, the little ads that are slightly annoying at the bottom of a lot of websites. Um, <clears throat> those we have to pay for out of pocket through our various different cooperative agreements. So those are subject to budget limitations. We do Facebook posts, which are called organic posts, which basically are Laurel or partners that have written something up and then we post it. Um, and then we also do ads and promoted posts, which we have to pay for as our budgets allow. Um, and so those are strategically deployed according to whether or not we can um, afford a suite of them or not in a given year. And then we do print publications when we have the funding. We've had ample funding some years and zero funding some other years for print. Um, what you're seeing in front of you right now are two different print examples of uh, things that we've gotten placed in like a magazine or a travel guide or um, the Old Farmer's Almanac is a great one that we place in. And then sometimes we do special projects when funding is available, especially if it's um, partner held funding. So for instance, we have never paid for our own billboards, but we have provided billboards for other people who have funding specific to billboards. And so that sort of paid advertising is really fluid depending on um, what we can afford as well as what other partners can afford. And these are um, two of a uh, absolute plethora of designs um, that we use for paid advertising uh, up on your screen. Okay, next slide. Great, I am so excited that we made it through the presentation without rushing, but with leaving a ton of time for questions. So I feel like we completely got the timing right on this uh, <laughs> meet the team webinar, if I can be so self-congratulatory, very exciting. Uh, so now we're just gonna open it up for questions, discussion, comments, constructive criticism, whatever you all want. Um, and I don't know if everyone can see the attendance, but the attendance today is nine participants, which is great. Uh, and so we are definitely in a good group for a discussion and not just a, um, sitting at each other in silence. We can be really interactive if you all would like to be. So everybody, this is your opportunity to shine. Yeah. You should be able to manually take yourself off mute too um, as a participant. I think I'm gonna continue sharing the screen too, just to keep the vibe going. <laughs> Well, that way too, we can, we can, uh, you got to put it on presentation. Um, we can um, switch to a slide if you had a specific question on slides too, you know, so uh, you can ask Laurel to scroll around if you're like, oh, that one with the thing, we can pull it up. Chase, what can we do for you? Hi, um, Chase from PI here. Thanks a lot for the presentation and making me aware of all the resources you guys have. Um, that's really awesome stuff, and I'll be sure to share them um, through the PI Invasive Species Council. My question, um, maybe this is too broad, but I was just wondering if you had any tips in regards to the um, Google AdWords grant. We were just successful in receiving that grant as well, and I tried to set it up to sort of intercept people that may be searching for some specific things uh, and hit them with our Don't Move Firewood page, but I, I haven't gotten many hits uh, with that method. Yeah, so Google AdWords is super tricky. Um, we actually use contractors to maximize our reach because it's just really difficult to manage. So please don't feel like you're you know, fumbling around in the dark alone. I think we're all fumbling around with Google AdWords. But the one thing that we have seen is that um, people respond better to Google AdWords that are insect centric. So for instance, in Prince Edward, 
if you wanted to talk about like uh, brown, is it brown spruce longhorn? Is that one of the ones up in your area that's really problematic? Yes, that would be one. Yep. Okay. So for instance, if you wanted to try to lure people to learn more about firewood through an ad that is around brown spruce longhorn beetle, instead, we found that's a little more successful than with Google AdWords than starting with firewood and then sticking with firewood. So, you know, somehow people get more excited about searching for the bugs and then they're like, oh, actually, I do want to learn about firewood on Prince Edward Island, you know that direction of sort of human thought, it's been working better for us for the last couple of years. So like we do a lot of ads on like what to know about Asian longhorn beetle or what to know about spotted lanternfly. We don't have brown spruce longhorn beetle in the United States yet, hopefully. Um, so we put these bug names in there, they click on it, and then it goes to a what you ought to know about this insect and firewood. So. That is great insight. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm really excited to hear that you were able to get an application accepted. That program can be a little tricky. So congrats. Um, I see a question in the chat. So um, William or Bill Seibold says, do you try to track compliance or non-compliance with wood moving regulations? And if a violator is found, what is done next? We are an outreach and education unit. So we don't particularly track compliance or non-compliance, and certainly we would not have involvement with violations. Um, I did see on this uh, participant list that um, a couple folks, uh, Karen Kaluzi and Gary Adams, actually, I'm just gonna call on them and say that they may actually have some interesting insights on violations and response because of their roles in their respective state governments. But before I hand it over to potentially one of them who may or may not appreciate that I just called them out, <laughs> I will say that we do, um, we have in the past checked on people's stated willingness to comply with regulations. That's kind of the outreach element of a regulation. Are you willing? Do you understand? Um, and we have found that when people understand the regulations, when they're taking a survey over the phone or internet or whatever, they say that they are, when they understand it, they say they are overwhelmingly willing to follow it. So. With that knowledge, what you can assume is that non-compliance events are either due to ignorance or the occasional outlying rude person who is unusual. So most people, if they know about it, will follow it. So you've essentially got two problems on your hands, jerks and people who genuinely don't know any better. Um, so Gary or Karen, I will totally call on you and see if you have anything to add, please. Uh, this is Gary. <clears throat> I, I think adding jerks into your <clears throat> into your verbiage is good. I like that one. Uh, you know, you're you're asking if we have any violations, and I'm from Montana. I'm with the USDA, so federal. And I'm from the state kind of part, and we've never had we had right. any violations here. Uh, that, that I'm aware of. I know that the uh, state and the Montana Invasive Species Council has put a pretty a lot of uh, information out knowing that Lee is right here in our state. So we have a little bit of an advantage uh, knowing that we have a direct line to her. But I think everybody needs to know that there's a direct line for everybody. Just because she resides in Missoula doesn't have anything to do with the ability for her and and uh, and her team to and Laurel to provide you know products for you. Um, I don't know, actually, Lee, you probably know more than I do, but the, the state, I don't know that has ever had any violations either. Some of the tools that we've had is, or tried to have is that the state, uh, a different state agency has a lot of aquatic invasive species check stations throughout the state to keep quagga mussels and zebra mussels out. And there's been a concerted effort to try to uh, attach firewood to that effort to, you know, if anybody that's coming here recreating in a boat may or may not also be camping and, and bring firewood with them. And uh, I don't know that that's ever been added on to their the requirement other than maybe from an educational standpoint, no, uh, no regulatory authorities. Um, yeah. I don't know what, what, what other, what else did you, were you asking Lee? or go ahead and add to that. 
Yeah, Gary. So thanks. Sorry, I associated because I live in Montana. As Gary mentioned, I always associate Gary with Montana, but he is indeed a federal employee. Um, so uh, we do work with the aquatic check stations in Montana through partnership with the Montana DNRC, which is the entity that runs the aquatic stations as the sort of managing group. And um, we have a, a full educational component to tell the check station employees about firewood issues. Um, and if sort of if the employees of the check station see something, they should do some light non-confrontational education about um, using all the firewood up at their next destination, not leaving any, not dilly-dallying with it, that kind of thing. They also have explicit instructions <laughs> to call Gary <laughs> if there's a true emergency. So if there is emerald ash borer crawling out of a pile of firewood in the middle of Montana, they literally have Gary's phone number. So the fact that Gary has never received a phone call means that that actually has not occurred to date, which is great. I'm glad to hear it. Um, but there, but you know, for instance, we do have that information in their educational materials uh, as an employee of the DNRC or one of their. Um, they they also partner with some of the tribes and so forth in order to put those check stations out there. So employees of different public entities throughout. Montana who run these check stations have that as part of their educational portfolio. So Bill, to get back to your question, are we tracking these compliance or non-compliance events? We are not, I am, I'm not regulatory and I wouldn't have a response element, but our partners do. And we try our best to support our partners with appropriate actions if they have an incident like that. And maybe Gary, I probably should have told you I gave him all your phone number, but you know, it's been great so far, so it's fine. Um, and, and Karen, I called on you because I'm wondering if you have any good insights from Maine, um, just potentially. Um, and then Bill, I'll get to your second question about federal rules as soon as Karen can weigh in if she would like to. Or maybe she would not like to, which is also okay. <laughs> Uh, maybe Karen stepped away or can't get herself off mute. So I'll just kick in with the, are there any federal rules on firewood at all? Heck yes, there are. Oh, I'm sorry, Karen. So if you wanted to, uh, you say you can't turn your microphone on. If you'd like to type in a quick response for Bill about non-compliance events in Maine and what you know, we'll read that in a second. There are quite a few federal rules on firewood, but the, um, the rules themselves tend to either be in regards to the international borders, so entrance of firewood from Canada, Mexico, or overseas, um, or directly pertaining to a forest pest that is federally regulated, such as Asian longhorn beetle, spongy moth, which was formerly known as gypsy moth. Um, trying to think quickly about other examples. Those are the two best examples. Um, and those federal quarantines are, you know, movement restrictions on firewood, and they definitely uh, still exist. It is still illegal to move potentially contaminated firewood from a spongy moth regulated infested area over that boundary into a non-regulated non-infested area. That would still absolutely be a federal rule that applies across the United States on firewood. However, the internal domestic movement regulations that used to pertain to emerald ash borer do not exist anymore um, federally. Now those regulations where they do exist are held in a state by state basis. So they are more specific and they are also uh, not necessarily identical between different states. So the rules have now changed in many ways, but that doesn't mean they're gone. It just means they're different which is one of the reasons that we've got the firewood comparison report because the complications of communicating those differences and those complexities are, are substantial. And we wanted to make sure people have information at hand um, so they can understand it too. Gary, you put your hand up. Please speak. We did, and if you covered this already, I just, I apologize in advance, but often what we do get from firewood companies is a request to certify their wood to be free of pests. And I just want to make sure that it's clear that, that that program does not exist anywhere. Uh, the, only, the only certification that we have, on a federal level anyway, is to certify 
firewood coming from a, an existing quarantine for some of those pests that you identified, Asian longhorn beetle, et cetera, that, uh, that was treated to the point to prevent the movement of a live pest in them. And that therefore it's certified to come from that area, out of that area. But people want, you know, they want to buy certified wood that just certified pest free. And there, there really isn't a, a national program for that. And I don't know that there's ever going to be one, but uh, a lot of times you'll see certified pest free on wood. I see it. Uh, you know, in stores, as I go around, I, I have this, Lee's kind of got me groomed to stop and look at firewood whenever I go through a gas station or a box store or something that has box, you know, firewood out there. Where's that from? Is it from Utah? Where's it from? You know, what's it say on there? And a lot of times it'll say pest free or something to pretend like it's uh, certified. And uh, to my knowledge, uh, you know, the, the USDA does not have a program for that. That's my that's my suggestion. And what's, it seems a little unfair because we're able to certify wood from a place where there's a pest, but we're not able to certify wood from a place there's not a pest, or, you know, a regulated pest. And that's a, a little bit of a conundrum for uh, both the process and for those that are trying to seek that certification. So I don't know if you want to add to that, Lee. But I'm sure yeah, that's plenty. great. So Gary is, of course, correct. You, we, there is this sort of odd and, and a little counterintuitive phenomenon that certified heat treated firewood, if certified by a federal entity, has to be coming from a federally regulated pest zone of infestation. So, for instance, for spongy moth, that would be most of the northeastern United States, as well as um, over to part of the Great Lakes region. Um, but you could not get that same certification in the state of Montana because we have zero presence of. Uh, infestation of spongy moth. However, um, Laurel, will you just flick to one of the slides that has the certification green map? State by state, there are state-based certifications that are applicable in this circumstance, even though they're not federal certifications. So excellent. Um, on the bottom right of the slide that Laurel just highlighted is our certification map. It's super small. Um, so I highly recommend you go to the original link, which is in the chat. But what you can see at even just at this, um, looking at it from the moon kind of distance of looking at the United States is that about half the states are dark green and dark green states in the maps legend are states that have a state based certification capability to say that a heat treatment has been applied to the firewood according to um, the rules of the state. So it's, it's a limited statement. It doesn't say it's pest free or anything. But you can say this has been certified according to the rules set forth by the state. And that is a lot better than nothing. And that is roughly half the states. If you'd like to look up the specifics of each state, please open the firewood comparison report, look up your own state. It's all in there. And with one caveat, <clears throat> that's not to say they're actually actively doing that right yes. now. A lot of these states just say like, hey, there's no demand for that. But if we were to get the request, yes, we do have the, you know, capacity to do that between, you know, their legislative capacity and or staff. So, yes. And that's a great example. So Montana, I happen to know as my home state um, falls into that group. Uh, the Montana Department of Agriculture has a structure they um, created. It is ready to go. To the best of my knowledge, I would have to double check as of you know now. Um, it has not been used. But were there to be a firewood producer in Montana that wished to have a Montana heat treatment certification to allow them to enter a market somewhere else where heat treatment was required, uh, the state of Montana has the capability to do so. Uh, I don't believe they're doing it right now just because of the type of firewood markets available to us in the Intermountain West, but they could if it was necessary. And that's important. Um, I'm going to read what Karen wrote because I happen to know the recordings don't show the chat. And so it's best to read it out loud. So I was asking Karen to please weigh in about Maine's experience about um, non-compliance. And she writes, we have some violations and sometimes we impose fines, but mostly we just confiscate the wood and try the education approach. Most people know about our out of state firewood ban. We have signs on a bunch of roads coming into Maine so these violations are intentional. So this gets to uh, my jerks theory of uh, firewood movement. Um, and the main forest service is the uh, entity that enforces the ban. So that's very helpful. I, no problem, Karen, that you couldn't figure out how to unmute. Sometimes Zoom is trickier than it really should be. 
Um, and then Bill weighs in with, thank you for the info. I think in Delaware, we only ban firewood from coming into state parks. Um, that is a not uncommon approach uh, for states. We see that in quite a few states. Um, that sometimes is driven by the fact that the state parks are um, more nimble in their ability to put in place a regulation than the state as a whole because of um, just the ways that those regulations uh, come down from you know state legislators who may or may not be willing to enter a regulatory sphere. So, um, so we do see that Delaware is not the only state that has only state parks based regulations. Uh, any other questions or comments or experiences? Um, we do try to make these presentations inclusive of Canada. Uh, we have a lot of information on provinces, uh, provinces, excuse me, um, as well as some, you know, uh, experience with CFIA and Canadian Forest Service. Um, but we do not have a firewood comparison report of the different provinces and their regulations. Um, we simply don't have the, the funding to accomplish that. It would be a substantial increase and it wouldn't be appropriate to fund with our uh, USDA APHIS US-based funding. Um, so that one particular document, we do not have a Canadian version of, but many of our materials, uh, we are careful to make sure they would apply evenly in Canada and the United States. I will mention too, um, the firewood map is, I don't know if I said this during the presentation, um, we go through it annually. So every summer and fall, I go through and just try to keep everything up to date and then reach out to whoever I can get a hold of that makes sense to in that state or province and get them to double check it and make sure it's accurate. I have not done that, finished that with Canada yet. I just finished with the United States. So I'm jumping into Canada now. Um, also though, I will mention to you about as far as like you said, Google AdWords and using the forest pests themselves as a way to kind of um, get people to hit on those firewood outreach sites and articles. Um, that's also another really great place for firewood outreach too. So I know I really focused on camping and state parks and everything. Um, but probably one of the less obvious places would be people just looking at information on the pests themselves and, you know, all those nerds out there like myself who just like reading about the bugs and then to then like, you know, include information on the firewood pathway as part of those pages is really important and a lot of states do do that but we've also seen a lot who don't and so that's just another great opportunity to kind of um you know increase that awareness where it might not be and for people who aren't again looking for firewood specific information to find it so yeah that's a um good reminder too that there are uh quite a few native forest insects and diseases that uh can be moved long distances on firewood as well. And when you move a native insect outside of its historical range, it can have unpredictable effects, just like any invasive species. Um, there are some laws that actually do exist governing, for instance, the movement of potentially mountain pine beetle infested wood. Those laws are pretty rare, um, but best practices apply very well to native pests um, and firewood and, for instance, salvage logging or um, even just individual firewood gathering and then transport for a lot of different native insects um, and diseases across North America. So again, like Laurel said, you should strive to put your outreach in places where people may run into it, even if they weren't specifically looking for firewood and forest pest information together. So the forest pest websites you should provide firewood information as well as the camping websites, you should provide firewood information, et cetera. Um, one of the things we've been kind of saying over and over again is uh, being ubiquitous is your friend. So you want these things to show up um, in many places in brief, just introduce the idea. We don't want you to swamp your website with too much information, then people won't read it anyway. Um, but, but, uh, even native pest information pages could potentially be really useful for education of just the basic concepts of how firewood can move forest pests long distances. Because um, that's 
That's what we talk about all day long and that's our expertise. Uh, okay, well, last call for additional questions, either in the chat or verbally, if you'd like to take yourself off mute. Um, we will be doing this presentation again. Uh, Laurel, can you please remind me when next week is that? It's on the 18th at 10 a.m. Eastern. Okay, 18th at 10 a.m. Eastern. So if you loved it and you'd like to refer a friend or a colleague to show up on the 18th and come to the next one, um, please go to the Don't Move Firewood website right in the news area, uh, the very top item in news is these web webinars series. And you can send that link right over to folks and invite them to next week's presentation where Laurel and I will be doing the same thing for new people. So we'll get new questions. It'll be very exciting. Uh, Laurel, do you have anything to add before you close us up? I don't think so. Um, again, I just, uh, I'll put it on the slide with my email. Um, if, you, if anyone here has noticed any um, any place where, you know, on our website, again, if you're looking at your own state or even the fire comparison report and you think that's not right, or, oh, we have a, you know, new link for this or new regulation coming out, please reach out to me. These are things that I'm constantly trying to keep up with and keep accurate. So, um, yeah, just, just reach out. That's all. That's right. We're always here on email. And, uh, with that, Thanks very much, everybody. We're going to turn off the recording and close it up. Thank you all.